This is the final scene of Taxi Driver. Pay attention to the camera. It darts around like a pair of eyes, taking everything in around Travis's apartment. Listen to the voiceover. Dear Mr. Bickle. It's Cyrus's father praising Travis for all of his heroics. What's inarguable here is that the final scene we are seeing everything from Travis's perspective. To take it a step further, it may be a safe assumption to say that we are so far into his head that we also buy into his delusions. Nobody thinks of him as a hero except for him, and that is how it is presented to the audience. We are so far into his head that we see what he sees, we hear what he thinks, and believe all of his self-deception. Take a minute and compare this to the opening scene in which we are surrounded by fog and the smoke of ambiguity. We see the cab from the outside, definitely not his perspective. Despite literally staring him into the eyes, we don't know him, he's a stranger. We don't care about him, and we certainly don't understand him. So my question is, how do we go from this to this? Well, as I'm sure you can imagine, there isn't a simple one-word answer. But through examining Taxi Driver as a whole, I think we can figure out how we become Travis Bickle. We should pretty much see everything from Travis's point of view. And this would isolate him more and put you more on his side, so to speak. The story begins when Travis takes up his position as the taxi driver. I think that this is an important detail that is worth mentioning because we follow Travis's collapse from the start. Before he takes the position, he found a way to exist in society. He was far from thriving, but also very far from where he becomes. To begin, he likes to laugh, he jokes around, he clearly doesn't take the position very seriously. How's your driving record? It's clean. It's real clean, like my pants. But it shows his human side. It helps the audience connect with the character, something which is reflected when this medium low angle is turned into a very close up at eye angle. He becomes less intimidating the more that we get to know him. We enter his world and see his perspective. And from this point on, we hear the story told with Travis's voiceover narration. The film tries to make Travis's worldview very clear. It doesn't want you to agree with it necessarily, but it does want you to understand it. In many ways, it paints a picture of contrast. We hear Travis give his thoughts, but just one scene earlier, we were shown his unkept and messy apartment. Thank God for the rain, which has helped wash away the garbage and the trash off the sidewalks. He still thinks of himself as an honorable discharge, but his life has devolved into something very different, something that he might even hate, but he doesn't see it that way. He still sees himself in a very noble light. Although he hates this part of life, he is still fascinated by it. He chooses to do what he does. He wants to observe. He takes pleasure in his discomfort. As long as he is able to judge others, he is happiest. And he chooses to do this so that he doesn't need to judge himself, so that he can continue down his road of degeneracy. What at first appears to pull him off of this path is the introduction of Betsy. She appeared like an angel out of this filthy mess. Someone who has her life in order. She works a job, is passionate about electing Palantine, has friends, and likes to joke around. She is quite possibly the last person in this entire city who needs saving, yet he makes it his mission to do just that. At this point, I want to point out that structurally, Taxi Driver is a very unique film. There is no connective thread that runs throughout the entire movie, connecting the beginning and the end. Instead, much as Travis drifts around picking up new hobbies, the film follows that, picking up new objectives and story beats. It makes the film harder to critically analyze, and to find patterns that you recognize from other films. And because of that, in many ways it's less about the story, and more about the experience of watching and observing Travis. But it's not just about watching and observing him. The film also places the audience in Travis's shoes. Pay attention to this scene. We see it from the first person perspective. We watch him struggle in social situations, all the while seeing these from his perspective. We put ourselves in his position. Early on, we watch him have two major social interactions. He hits on the woman in the movie theater, and this goes poorly. You can tell me what your name is. I'm not going to do anything. You want me to call manager? Well, you know, Pay attention to how comfortable he is. All right, okay. I'm just... okay. Can I have a chuckle, sir? He's used to rejection. So later, when he asks Betsy out and she begrudgingly says yes, he completely misreads the situation and builds her up to be something more than she truly is. And I felt when I walked in that there was something between us. There was an impulse that we were both following. 
Betsy, who does not know the appropriate way to respond to Travis, unintentionally leads him on just by simply being nice to him. When I walked in, I knew I was right. Did you feel that way? I wouldn't be here if I didn't. One of the first people to ever do that to him, which makes him believe that the two are perfect for one another. Of course, this simply isn't true, and Travis's lack of social awareness ends up ruining the relationship after he takes her to an adult theater. You know, I didn't know that you'd, you'd feel that way about this movie. I don't know much about movies, but if I... You feel the kind of movie she go to? He is unable to read her discomfort upon arriving, and unable to read her discomfort at the theater, and is yet confused when she tries to leave. After this, we see one of the most uncomfortable scenes in the entire movie. Travis on the phone trying to get Betsy back. A scene like this that is so powerful because everyone watching has dealt with rejection in some form or another at one point in their life. Through this scene, we become Travis. We connect with him and understand his pain. We feel sorry for him while seeing ourselves as him. And then the camera moves away. We feel so much pity for him that we can't even bring ourselves to look at him. And the film never paints Travis as a bad person. He certainly does bad things later on in the film, which we'll certainly be discussing, yet we don't hate him because of it. In fact, we feel sorry for him. We know that with his history in the war, he's dealing with mental health issues and is just trying to exist, but does not know how to do that. And I think it's worth pointing out that distinction. And after Betsy makes it very clear that she wants nothing to do with Travis, he continues to live his life, wallowing in his own loneliness, depression, and anxiety. He still has a hatred of the world around him, but it's only when he picks up the passenger and sees the violence does Travis consider being violent himself. Earlier, he wanted someone else to clean up the streets. Whatever it is, he should clean up this city here, because this city here is... Like an open sewer, you know? He asked for a flood, he wanted Palantine to do it, or some other external force. However, when the passenger shows off his violent side, I'm gonna kill her, I'm gonna kill her with a 44 Magnum pistol. I have a 44 Magnum pistol, I'm gonna kill her with that gun. Travis realizes that he can clean up the streets himself, albeit through a lot of violence. If you're unaware, the passenger is played by Martin Scorsese, the film's director. I know that the actor who was originally supposed to play the passenger simply didn't show up on set, so Scorsese filled in, but I do find it appropriate that the film's director goes on to direct Travis down his own dark path within the film. You must think I'm pretty sick or something. You know, you must think I'm pretty sick. Right? You must think I'm pretty sick? and down a very dark path does he go. He arms himself, ready for whatever his deranged mind cooks up. During this entire process, he views it as self-improvement. He thinks that this is good for him. Meanwhile, he continues to live in his vices. He still goes to the pornographic theater, he still takes pills, and still lives a life very similar to the one that he did earlier. The big difference is that he has become completely unhinged. His goal is to kill Palantine. He knows how much he means to Betsy, and according to his sick and twisted logic, this is how he's going to get revenge on her. Travis has become everything that he hates, and he doesn't even see it. His anger towards Betsy has removed his last protective layer. All that she ever did was to be nice to him, one of the first people to ever do so, and the result, he became completely unhinged. After killing Palantine, he plans on turning on to the rest of the world and cleaning it up, so to speak. During this scene, he shows how willing he is to kill. Money! Reach in your sock, you got more bread. That's it, man. Give me the rest hey. of the fucking bread. Hey. Was the robber a good man? Certainly not. Did the robber deserve to die? Well, probably not either. But this scene reaffirms Travis's belief about the world. It's a dark place with bad people. At this point, he is one of them. But look at how easily this world simply accepts murder. Mm. Don't worry about it, man. I'll take care of it. No, man, just, just get out of here. No. His other course of action is to try and protect Iris, the young prostitute who entered his car earlier. Much as he viewed Betsy as someone who needed saving, he views Iris in the same way, and much more appropriately with her. She is someone who absolutely needs saving. He makes his plan to murder Palantine and give Iris the money that he has saved up that she needs to escape and to live a better life. This is when he chooses to expose himself to the world to show what he really is. He tries to murder Palantine, but is stopped. He decides that he does need to protect Iris, and does this in the most violent way imaginable. Suck on this. Oh, 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 oh. 
Rather than simply driving her to safety, he elects to kill everyone with whom she associates, the pimps, the thugs, everyone whom he hates. And he does just that. And he does all of this not for Iris. She's a factor in it, but he mostly does this as a way to express his violence to the world. A world that has kicked him when he was down, taken away everything that he had, and left him a shell of his former self. And when all of that happened and nobody is around to keep him in check, this is the result. In the end, he is living in his delusional world. He is the hero. He saved the girl. He killed the bad people. To what extent others believe that is up for debate. I'm a firm believer that just after the homicidal spree, he's either dead or in jail, and the entire ending is his delusional thoughts of a life that is somehow better. When I first was writing the script, I thought it was about loneliness. What I learned while writing the script is that this was about a man who suffered from the pathology of loneliness. He wasn't lonely by nature. He was lonely as a defense mechanism. And he reinforced his own loneliness by his own behavior. And the pathology grew until it became malignant and violent. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed. This is the last film dissection that I'll be releasing in the foreseeable future. I wanted the last one to be on a film that means a lot to me, and Taxi Driver definitely fits that criteria. It was one of the first movies that I saw and really appreciated the filmmaking and the style behind it, and it's one of those movies that just has so much to say, and I'm really glad that I was able to unpack and discuss it here. I think it's an appropriate way to end the film dissection, it really is. One of the best movies of all time, and I'm glad that I was able to end on a movie like this. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your support. And if you're interested in seeing it, why I'm leaving the film dissection behind, there's a link on the screen right next to my playlist of videos on Martin Scorsese. Thank you.